after several years of absence. Um, this is a lunchtime meeting, and this particular lunch is a two-course meal. The, the main dish is EU as a global actor, but there's a small hors d'oeuvre, um, which is about, um, which uh, some of you may have picked up a, a paper, um, which is entitled Britain, Ireland, and Schengen, Time for a Smarter Bargain on the Visas. I, this is something I published um, a few months ago, uh, and I thought it might be of interest to some of you here, because um, uh, I was originally observing the apparently increasing cost, economic cost, in terms of tourist and international business in general for the UK, of the self-exclusion from Schengen, in <coughs> which the kind of iconic example of it is the uh, is the plane load of, uh, of Chinese group tourists who come to do Europe, and they get their Schengen visas, and they uh, skip the UK because they don't want to be bothered to get another visa, which I can quite sympathise with in the circumstances. And this, um, and, and Ireland is sucked into this uh, by the same token. And so, um, as you all familiar with uh, British politics, more or less, uh, you know the present British government is not going to join Schengen. However, the question is whether there can be a smarter deal. And uh, I came to the conclusion that there was no reason, real reason, why if these costs are assessed realistically, why one could not have um, a request by... Uh, Britain and Ireland together to make a cooperation agreement with the Schengen area uh, for mutual recognition of each other's <coughs> visas. And in the course of doing this, I became aware that is precisely what Ireland has done unilaterally with respect to the United Kingdom. Um, and so uh, you're already ahead of the game. Um, and I imagine that there'd be no problem at all for Ireland to follow through this proposal um, if, um, if Whitehall and Westminster could be persuaded uh, to move. Now, maybe uh, in this future Olympic year, 2012, the sensitivity over pro these kind of problems will, will mount. And actually, um, I, was in, um, I was contacted last week by a journalist of The Economist newspaper who is actually writing an article on, on the subject for next week. And I'm not quite sure what she's going to write, but she may help uh, open up the subject matter. So that's at the end of the hors d'oeuvre. And uh, so I go on to the to the main course. <clears throat> um, okay, first of all, the context. The context for this uh, business is um, is obviously um, you want me to go there? No, no. no. <laughs> so, so if you want to change it, you just aim, aim, aim at it. Oh, I've got yes, to aim yes. at that, yeah. Okay, well, I'm not... Um, so the, the context is, is obviously uh, extremely difficult with uh, um, the Eurozone crisis, which is um, extraordinarily serious, deep, and, uh, and dramatic, <clears throat> and unless the resolution to that comes pretty fast. The whole of the House is going to be uh, in even bigger trouble. Um, but... Um, I would say that we should view this business of the EU as a global act uh, as a long-term game in any case, <clears throat> 20, 30, 40-year game. Uh, speaking personally, I've been more or less in this Europe business since uh, the Irish and British and Danish accession in 1973, so almost 40 years, 35 to 40 years. And we're talking about systemic developments, major systemic developments for a serious development of the EU as a global actor. And if, the, um, if it's tough at the moment for propositions of this kind, uh, well, we have to make up our own minds as to what is the rational, inevitable course of the history of European diplomacy going, going to be. And uh, there, there are some important things to say, which I'm going to go into. But it's not all long-term stuff. Um, either. Um, uh, one question, of course, is if the Eurozone crisis is resolved um, through uh, a new treaty for the Eurozone uh, members as to <coughs> whether there will be an urge to say, some you can hear them saying, uh, Paris in particular, um, um, let us 
focus on those member states who are really willing in general, politically as well as economically, to go far ahead, and indeed Germany too. And the question then would be whether this foreign policy business should be clustered around the Eurozone or whether it should be kept to um, the, the EU27. Well, my re response to that would be, well, if that's what um, our leaders are going to do, that will finally tear apart the European Union uh, completely, and then we're in an entirely new game. Um, and then, on the other hand, you can remark that the uh, Eurozone member states are not conspicuous for their unity in foreign policy matters, as we have observed over Germany's position in relation to the Libyan war, for example. So, for the moment, I would take absolutely the opposite view, saying the Eurozone crisis is terribly serious and has to be resolved, but uh, this is all the more reason why the EU should try to uh, get its foreign policy show reasonably um, on, on the road uh, and not to make the linkage between the two. Well, the Eurozone crisis, of course, is terribly serious, and the whole problem is because um, our great leaders didn't accept the advice that Professor Martin O'Donoghue and I and some others offered in approximately 1978 in a document called the McDougall Group Report, which some of you may be aware of vaguely, which was all about <coughs> what basically Berlin would call the transfer function or the fiscal union or transfer union. Uh, so, Martin, we went into that in great detail, but that was forgotten, and now we see its cost up to a point. Well, that's an aside. Now, let us get into the, into the um, uh, main business. Okay, European diplomacy, a long and noble tradition, um, Hans Holbein there, and then even earlier, there's this one, which is rather interesting. This is Marco Polo presenting his credentials in um, Dadu, the then Beijing in 1266, <coughs> uh, Europe's first global <laughs> ambassador. Uh, it's an absolutely impeccable performance of the United Europe presenting itself as one in Beijing. And then um, we now fast forward to uh, 2009, and now we're in Copenhagen, the infamous um, climate change summit where the Europeans had a, a very effectively united position on substance, but the organization of how they presented themselves was like this, and the result was this, namely the famous or infamous meeting of the BRICS um, and Obama alone with the European Union not present. So this is, I'm afraid, a perfect illustration of the costs of the obsolescence of today's European uh, diplomacy. So the, my, the question, the, my mainly going to talk about um, how um, European diplomacy should be uh, restructured um, in uh, a legal as well as a bureaucratic and, and political sense. So the question is, why, why should this be done? Um, a cost-benefit analysis on the functioning of European diplomacy these days um, reveals huge expensive <coughs> duplication. Uh, as you mentioned, I was in, in Moscow, and so uh, to this day in Moscow we now have 28 European Union embassies with delegation, and all of them are writing <coughs> um, their confidential notes, uh, mostly copied out of the Moscow Times, uh, as to uh, whether Putin's popularity is going to continue to slide or, or not. <coughs> so, dear European taxpayer, you can pay for that 28 times over if you feel rich enough and, uh, and magnanimous enough for the career of the, all of these diplomats to do so. Um, however, um, these are tough times budgetarily, are they not? And I've become aware in conversation over lunch uh, that the Irish diplomatic service is on a kind of <coughs> no, no replacement uh, Paradigm was to say when somebody retires, no, he's not replaced. So I guess that means something like two to three percent attrition per year in reduction of the costs. Uh, and even Sweden is doing this. The richest and biggest budget surplus country has cut its embassies, bilateral embassies in Slovakia and um, uh, Slovenia, uh, and also 
In Brussels, they abolished the embassy to Belgium. The Belgians complained of it, and so they said, no, no, we haven't really abolished it. We have a man in the permanent representation who's the ambassador to Belgium. So these Swedes, they're quite tough-minded people, uh, and maybe they are sending a message to everybody. So uh, punching below the weight, it's obvious, it's massive, um, in spite of this uh, huge cost. And then, in addition, what is happening in the world? The content of diplomacy is becoming uh, much more global regulatory policies. For an American account, uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter of Princeton University has written an excellent book that some of you may have seen called The New World Order. It is all about the center of gravity in substantive diplomacy going into the area of regulatory policies where the European Union has, uh, has um, big competencies. Um, and I would say also, you know, uh, frankly speaking, what are our na Irish or British or French or Lithuanian national interests uh, in Sri Lanka? Um, um, okay, here are a few statistics of it. <coughs> um, <coughs> um, let's take the staff numbers. You can't quite read that clearly, but... The EU 27 member states employ 93,000 people um, alongside um, 27,000 for the United States. And then the UK, France and Germany are at about 22,500 each. 12,500 each, I'm sorry. So they, 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 those major member states, are <coughs> about four times as big as the EU External Action Service. These are total numbers of staff. You've got the local agents, etc., but the story doesn't change very much. Um, so there we are. We have 3,000 embassies worldwide. Um, how many of them do you really want to pay for, ladies and gentlemen, taxpayers? Right. Now, the Lisbon Treaty was meant to be uh, about uh, getting a, a world-class European dip diplomatic service. Um, and um, so how has this been working out? And this is what I, I'm going to go into. Um, in fact, the starting point is not that bad. I mean, um, and um, so I'm going to go into the legal aspects uh, now. Um, <clears throat> yes. In preparing this book, uh, it required quite, quite a lot of research work, and so I think, I, I hope it's considered a, a useful reference. Um, we went into the European Commission's um, treaties database and discovered that the European Union <coughs> has signed <coughs> 249 ma multilateral treaties and 649 bilateral treaties. Many of these multilateral treaties, I guess Tom O'Dwyer was partly responsible for, commodity agreements, and that sort of stuff. You know about that, yeah. So relative, many of them were relatively small, specialised affairs. But still, this is legally binding uh, conventions of international law. But they're not all only the olive oil convention of 19-something or other. Um, many of them uh, are more important than that, and we will go into them in the moment. So, but then um, the question is, what is the status of the European Union actually in the multilateral organizations of the world? In the small commodity agreements, the EU is properly represented normally, of sometimes uh, the only contracting party and the only spokesperson. And Tom nods his acquiescence. Uh, uh, and then, uh, but then mostly in international organizations, status um, is uh, way behind substance of competence. So now we're going into this <coughs> legal stuff. The Treaty of Lisbon at least clarified the competence structure of the European Union, as I'm sure all of you here are aware, the exclusive competences, but then this huge mass of shared competencies, a list about this long. It's really everything except for the exclusive competencies. And they are subdivided between <coughs> what we may call hard shared competencies, agriculture, energy, internal market, 
justice and home affairs, environment business, where the um, EU finds itself being contracting party to international uh, legal business, but alongside the member states. Um, and this leads into <coughs> um, this very messy business of who represents the European Union in the area of shared competences. Um, uh, the Treaty of Lisbon <coughs> didn't sort this one out, and in the first year post-Lisbon, there have been a lot of <coughs> mucky uh, intra-European diplomacy over who should speak the European Union, as in this uh, Mercury International Convention, uh, where a standoff between the Commission and the Member States as to who to speak um, resulted in nobody uh, being able to speak to the European Union at the, Co the Stockholm uh, International Conference. Um, the Belgian presidency of uh, over a year ago uh, actually was impeccable. This, by the way, this is Belgian. I, uh, I like living in Belgium very much. As you know, we haven't had a government for 538 days in Belgium. However, they managed, the non-government managed their Belgian presence in the Union, European Union extremely well. I think even there's a Belgian diplomat here present. Is that right? So I don't want to embarrass him. Uh, <coughs> and um, so, um, anyway, the point was here, whether the dear member states of the European Union, whether how many of the foreign ministries were saying on the quiet, on the side, actually this Lisbon business was a bit of a mistake. Um, they went a bit far. I think we should use loose provisions to claw back competence for our member state diplomacies and fight over every small procedural issue that is open to controversy. Uh, and I would say most of the member states I would criticise for this. I would criticise the British most of all who led the clawback procedure and this has been consuming a disgraceful amount of time for the last year and year and a half. However, the objective principles, I would say, are clear. What, um, where the EU is a contracting party, um, it has to be uh, properly present in the governance of the Convention or the international organisation, um, either exclusively in the exclusive competencies or with member states where they are also present. Um, you can have virtual membership status, I mean, in our argument, um, that is to say an enhanced observer status, where the organisation is not <coughs> um, acting in a legally binding manner, UN General <coughs> Assembly often, and OECD, for example, but where there are hard legally binding matters at stake, then the EU has to be uh, fully present. At the moment, it is an ordinary observer in many cases where it uh, should be more present. The precedent for how to do this exists um, under the name of regional economic organization. Um, the term is already used in WTO and FAO. Tom, right? Uh, 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 there the EU is present, or the European Commission has been present as full member and many commodity agreements as well. But um, the full use of this uh, recognised precedent is way lagged behind the reality of EU competences. And in uh, international air transport, uh, IATA, and international <coughs> maritime organisation to take... These are two perfectly clear cases where the European Union has major operational legally binding competence and where the member states will haggle in the antechambers of the general assemblies of these organisations to impede the process for the European Union to become a full member of these organisations. And that is um, um, irrational and deplorable in any uh, reading of the European uh, interest. Now, a few important cases that have been moving in the last year. The UN General Assembly, I guess many of you, certainly the diplomats here present, are aware that the <coughs> uh, EU um, uh, a year ago made a, a push to have enhanced 
uh, status at the UN General Assembly. It went almost to a vote. It was clear that they were not going to get a majority. This came as a terrible shock to the European diplomatic corps at large. How can it be that this wonderful European Union, the embodiment of global enlightenment, uh, could not get a majority vote um, in, in the UN General Assembly? The conclusion drawn, correctly drawn, uh, was that the, um, the European Ex External Action Service and the member states needed to work harder lobbying. Hmm? And they got to work, and they did work energetically at lobbying. And so in the second time round, the beginning of this year, it passed almost on a unanimity basis. And so um, the European Union now has enhanced uh, status, the UN General Assembly, a uh, bit in the category that uh, the Palestinian Authority would like to uh, have. I, I open the parenthesis on the Palestinian Authority. Um, uh, the UNESCO case, of course, it was uh, operational um, a few weeks ago, and there the member states distinguished themselves by dividing three ways. Uh, one third of them were for yes, and one third of them were for no, and the one third were for abstain. Here, ladies and gentlemen, you have 27 diplomatic corps who are all expensively defining uh, their preferred position on Palestinian representation uh, in, in UNESCO and dividing in every conceivable direction. This is, what should be the adjective? Uh, I would say it's pathetic. Um, and all member states uh, ought to use this case um, as something to blush over. We are all paying for our 27 diplomatic corps and engaging in this uh, diplomatic dance uh, at UNESCO at great cost to all of our 27 bureaucracies to the point of you all being irrelevant and uh, enhancing uh, the lack of respect that the rest of the world will have. So please, uh, the call would be um, wake up over this sort of business. Now, the next case, important case, is, is the IMF Executive Board. And I understand from the press, but I haven't seen this officially yet, that actually the Commission in its um, Eurozone governance package has now uh, got the courage to say, actually, in the IMF, there ought to be a single Eurozone seat. This was discussed, um, I know, but it's not generally known, between France and Germany, uh, a few years ago, when um, I believe that Germany was willing to have a single Eurozone seat uh, and engaged in negotiation with France, who in the end concluded that this was a sufficiently serious threat to uh, contagion in UN Security Council, that they preferred not to. And so it didn't happen. But instead, last year, we had this very painful period of trying to reconcile or try to get the European Union's overrepresentation in IMF in the Executive Board into line with global trends with the rise of, of the BRICS. And, and um, this also was a very, very serious uh, learning example for the European Union. And I'm not sure how far. Uh, we have all absorbed this. But there was impasse there. The Europeans were refusing to budge, and I think the Dutch were the most obstinate of all, uh, but not alone. <coughs> um, and our dearest and nearest ally, the United States, said after a while, look, chums, our dear European friends, you realise what is going to happen if there's no agreement on how to revise the board, the default position is that the number of seats on the board reverts to about three less than the present board. <clears throat> and in accordance with Article something of the statutes, the three who are ejected are the three that have the least weights, which include India and Brazil. So um, delicate, uh, delicately managed, impeccably managed, uh, US diplomacy said, Look, dear friends, do you wish to be responsible for throwing India and Brazil 
in the year 2010 out of the IMF Executive Board. So that knocked heads together a little bit to the point of getting this half-baked compromise where the Belgians and the Dutch and the Spanish agreed to some half-baked solutions, and that was enough for the time being. However, things have moved on. The drama now is that Eurozone could do with a few hundreds of billions of dollars um, from IMF uh, and behind IMF other rich states. Oh, but the IMF cannot lend to uh, non-states. Hmm? Uh, but monetary unions, according to the statutes of the IMF, can be present on the board if the monetary union members agree to it. So the legal political infrastructure is potentially there. Um, and this is uh, something that, uh, well, it should happen sometime. Okay. World Bank is not dramatic like the IMF, but it's the same story. EU largest uh, international aid donor and not on the board <coughs> of the World Bank. Uh, Council of Europe, sorry, Council of Europe is currently an interesting case. Um, the Treaty of Lisbon um, resulted in the uh, accession of the European Union to the Convention of Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Basic rules, if you, and so the Strasbourg Court becomes the supreme arbiter of human rights in anything that the European Union should do. Okay, normal rules of the game. If you accept the jurisdiction of the court, you have to enter into the governance of the court. That means that the European Union has to be a full member of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe and able to appoint a judge to the court, etc. And these proposals actually are currently being negotiated. Maybe somebody in the room knows exactly where it's got to, but I, I believe that is in the course of being settled in a rather quiet way. But it's a very uh, good example of how to rationalise uh, or bring up to date the governance structures in relation to the legal competences of the European Union. Uh, but there are many other cases. I've mentioned IATA and IMO already, um, but uh, these other cases, uh, uh, many other cases amongst the 249 multilateral treaties. Um, so um, that's basically my story. Um, um, now, another critical remark uh, towards... Um, the present stance taken in the Council of Ministers of the European Union by our member states. They said, yes, welcome to the European External Action Service, and we suggest we attach to this the concept of budget neutrality. That, that means the budget is frozen, basically. <coughs> so <coughs> we look forward to your full development of your role in the world, uh, but um, on zero growth in your budget, um, this is such um, an absurd proposition that they, after a while, changed the language and said they must move towards budgetary neutrality. Um, now, um, this comes back to the figures I was showing early on. I mean, uh, what in the 21st century should be the structure of European diplomacy? It is today grotesquely obsolete and excessively expensive uh, with a lot of national diplomats um, doing nothing but engaging in up to a point uh, bureaucratic uh, protectionism. Of course, they're doing things which are necessary, uh, but even, even the visa business, of course, can be Europeanized for the Schengen area and, and should be, to, and it's beginning to, to happen. Of course, you have to have a commercial interest to pursue, but on the other hand, how far are national diplomacies really effective mechanisms for commercial sales? Well, it's up to a point, yes, but uh, they shouldn't overdo it. So, um, dear friends, this is... Uh, the issue. The EU, according to its competences, uh, a post-Lisbon treaty, uh, should in any rational world be more properly represented. 
there has to be a big shakeout uh, in national diplomacies. And I know in this painful budgetary period this is happening under the force of budgetary uh, compulsion more than, if you like, seeing this European thing uh, develop. But at the same time, we're in this world where even our major member states are, frankly, not very influential in global affairs um, and unless they unify their positions. So um, this is a story which um, uh, is not very... Uh, Timely. Well, it is very timely. Not very timely in the sense that the mood uh, is very bad at the moment. And is the Eurozone going to crack up? And that's the end of Europe, says Chancellor Merkel. OK, so the Eurozone thing has to be sorted out, whether it's the European Central Bank or the Euro bonds or some hybrid of the two that will be the solution. That has to happen fast. Uh, but in any case, should... Uh, yeah, so that has to happen. Right. Otherwise, the game is, is over. Mm -hmm. But th that will happen, I suppose, because the cost of breaking up the Eurozone is, is too big. Mm -hmm. And so it will happen sometime uh, in the near future. And at the same time, uh, for the next 20 to 30 years, this progressive development and upgrading of the EU's role as a global actor needs to be pursued. Thank you. Thank you very much.